At the end of 1991, the USSR splintered into 15 independent states. Russia inherited three quarters of Soviet territory, but was itself not a stable country. In November of 1991, Chechnya declared its independence. The Russian government in Moscow opposed this secession. One year later, Chechen President Jokar Dudayev refused to sign a new treaty of federation with Russia. The Russian government decided to quash the Chechen independence movement by once more sending in their tanks. They're looking at past experience, which is this idea that tanks are very awe-inspiring. So this idea they're coming with a Red Army, that alone is going to win the day. The Russian Army's most modern tank was called T-80, of which some 5,000 had been built. It was the fastest Soviet tank ever, nicknamed the Flying Tank. It was the first to be equipped with a gas turbine engine, which gave it a top speed of 70 kilometers per hour. Unlike the T-72, which was a mass production tank, the T-80 was reserved for the Army's elite. In December 1994, the Russian army launched an attack into Chechnya. The Russian Secretary of Defense was certain it would only be a matter of days to take the capital, Grozny. My first impression when I crossed the city, I barely recognized the place. There were only some fragments of streets and buildings. Everything was destroyed. And then I saw the incredible number of armored vehicles that had been brought to our repair shop. Andrei Brinkin was a Russian engineer specializing in tank repair. He was 32 when he was sent to Grozny as part of the Russian Mykop Brigade. He was horrified by what he found there. The brigade had lost 20 of its 26 tanks during the first two days of fighting. The soldiers who were caught in the massacre of December 31st to January 1st told me what happened. The Maykop Brigade had entered the city in absolute silence. They drove to the train station. They looked around. People were walking around, cars were there. Nothing could foretell the horror that was about to follow. And suddenly, the trap closed in on them. The Mykop Brigade's tank column was torn to shreds without time to react. 800 out of 1,000 men perished. The massacre continued during the following days. 74 Russian soldiers were taken prisoner. Andrei Brinkin discovered the face of the enemy that of the Chechen army. The Chechen forces, they've got a lot of weaponry that's been there since the Soviet period. They've got a lot of simple things like RPG weapons, rocket-propelled grenades. They knew they were not going to be stopping the Russian army in the field meeting them in traditional battle. Don't forget that in the Chechen army, soldiers were not inexperienced recruits, but veterans who were between 30 and 40 years old and who had served before in the Soviet army. Those were trained and mature men. They were brave. They would stop at nothing.
their strategy against Russia's tanks, urban warfare. First, the Chechens would block a street with some of the few armored vehicles they possessed. Their goal was to lure the Russian convoy into an ambush. They knew the capacity of the T-tanks that were coming against them. So you've got people with rocket propelled grenades, say, hiding in a second or third floor window, firing down where the armor's thinnest. From buildings overlooking the street, Chechen snipers destroyed the first and the last tank of the column. This would trap the rest of the tanks, allowing them to be picked off one by one. Traditionally, with urban warfare, is the argument's always been you need infantry as well so that they're flushing out tank killer squads that might be there ready to knock out your tanks. But the conscripts are very reluctant to leave their vehicles in the first place, which makes them even more vulnerable. After four days of fighting, some 200 armored vehicles were destroyed. 2,000 soldiers had been killed. The Russian tank offensive had become a disaster. The army gathered its remaining forces outside the city to review its strategy. This time, the tanks were to be screened by infantry in order to counter anti-tank fire. These forces would advance street by street in smaller groups. Andre Brinkin stayed in Grozny for two months of fighting. The first Chechnya campaign served to show one thing, that you shouldn't go headlong into such a situation unprepared. Simple soldiers and officers paid with their lives. I saw that with my own eyes. In two years, the war in Chechnya claimed 30,000 lives. In August 1996, Russian President Boris Yeltsin was forced to call for a ceasefire and open negotiations with the Chechens. It was an unmitigated humiliation for Russia. What I think Grozny does for a number of the Western nations is it, initially, there's that sense of don't put tanks in an urban area because it can bottle them up, it channels them, it gives anti-tank teams multiple avenues to approach a tank and be hidden so they can knock a tank out. So unless you've got your tactics very worked through, using infantry to help protect the tanks, the tanks can be of use in an urban area, but they need infantry with them to get the best value. Over the next decade, the disastrous tank battle of Grozny was analyzed by tank generals worldwide. The question on everybody's mind was, can tanks fight in modern urban warfare? Or are they nothing but steel death traps for their crews? 